Welcome and good morning to the Clackamas County Board of Commission Issues and Updates. Nancy Bush, you're sitting in for Gary Schmidt this week. He's on vacation. Would you like to uh, kick it off? Yes, good morning and thank you. Uh, we do have all commissioners here today except for Commissioner Schrader who is out. Um, Commissioner, I mean, I'm sorry, Chair Smith, can you adjourn I mean, can you convene as the housing authority? Yes, I can. The board will now convene as a housing authority of Clackamas County for the next items. Okay, we'll have Rod and Terry come up. Number one is approval of a, a personal service contract with the Father's Heart Street Ministry, ministry to uh, provide supportive services to households and hotel motel based emergency shelters and assignment to Clackamas County. Contract value is $500,170 for one year. Funding is through Metro Supportive Housing Services. No county general funds are involved. Rod? Yes, if approved, um, the Father's Heart Ministry will continue to provide supportive services to households staying in 51 hotel motel based emergency shelters. The Supportive Housing Services program is focused on providing permanent supportive housing and other supportive services to vulnerable individuals in Clackamas County. Uh, these are folks who are experiencing or who are at, or are at risk of experiencing homelessness, many of whom have disabilities. Thank you, Rod. I would also like to welcome Housing Commissioner Ann Leinstra, who is online. Welcome, Ann. Okay, um, uh, Commissioner Fisher, you're in the queue. Yeah. Thanks. Good to see you. Good morning. So, question We are convened as the Housing Authority, yes. but I'm confused. Uh, my understanding is that we were sort of consolidating our homeless services through another department and that housing authority would not be the lead agency on SHS. And you're absolutely true. That's happening. And you'll see later in the agenda, uh, we we're assigning all these contracts over to the new division. And so but <laughs> okay, as we so today, I should read ahead and I did not do that. So thank you very much. Yes, I don't have thank any you for the question. other questions. I should go ahead and continue to explain because I'm not sure. I yeah, basically, we're still setting up the financial structure for the new division. So until we can get that completed, we'll have to still operate with as hack. But as soon as, um, and we're talking, <laughs> we're, thinking we're weeks away from this, where the new division will have its financial system set up. And then we're already assigning all those contracts from HAC to the new division. So we have that completed process that we've been talking about for about a year. Okay. Uh, so I have a different question. Um, um, uh, yeah, you finished, Commissioner Fisher. Oh, yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. So, Rod, um, I sent an email here a couple of weeks ago about asking about the issue. What is our strategy for hotel, shelter beds, so forth? And, you know, are we going to, you know, I think initially, at least a year ago, we were talking about because of the cost of bringing that down and, and closing that out. And so it seems like this is going to be more of an expansion or potentially or the same or more. So my question is, what is the, and I've asked this question, what is the capacity um, of willing hotel owners and total number of rooms? And because I'm kind of concerned about us oversubscribing, so to speak, that this nonprofit may want to do it and this nonprofit is going to do it. And pretty soon you might have more more agencies looking for than there is market. So do we know what that market is for total rooms? This is Vahid. I'm think that this is a great question. I don't yeah. think this is a proper place for it, however, because okay. we have two housing discussions coming up. Paul, if you could hold that question and tell our discussions later in today's program, okay. I think that would be good not for consent agenda today. Oh, and then it'll okay. give staff time to formulate the answer. Okay. Well, then, I mean, I'll just ask the question specific to this one then. How many beds is assigned in this $500,000? This uh, how long? is really, because uh, I had asked a similar question of the group. Um, this, is, this is funding for the supportive services, the services part of it. This is not buying the units. This is not renting space, so to speak, or rooms. This is about the services piece. So, so it's 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 a different. If you see what I'm saying, this okay, is not I, this I is not I, buying hotel space or, or paying rents. This is this is the services that will be provided by the nonprofits to those who are in those spaces, wherever those might end up being. Okay, I'm sorry that the title mis misled I, me. I agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Uh, Commissioner Scholl. Yes. Good morning. Um, yeah, my question was, 
I didn't see anything in the contract on allowable percent of overhead and profit. Now this 500,000, it just doesn't, like you just mentioned to Commissioner's office, that it doesn't pay for hotel rooms. It just pays for administrative overhead. Is that administrative overhead at Our Father's Heart Ministry, or is it other nonprofits also? No, this is just Father's Heart Ministry. And administrative overhead, I would define that differently than operational services. This is paying yeah, for operational I, I, I services. I understand. And, uh, okay, so what jumps out at me in a time when we have uh, a huge problem with homelessness and providing services to hundreds of people that need services um, with limited money, uh, $500,000 for one year to one nonprofit to do administration of support to the people who need housing seems to, to me to be an awful lot of money for the services, administrative services of just one nonprofit. I mean, Mr. Cook, what, what jumps out at me on this contract is, is I wish I just had 500,000 bucks to go down to the 213 and down on uh, the uh, uh, trail, you know, going across 82nd and just start picking up people and just, you know, being able to take one, one, one dollar that we have from supportive housing and provide it directly to one person who needs it. You see what I mean? Yeah, this, this, I think this, it was um, that easy. Um, I, I know it's not easy, Mr. Cook, but what, what I'm compelled to mention this morning is that that is a lot of money for administrative overhead in a, a climate yeah. where we have so many people who need that money directly to support and, them. And you, and you keep saying administrative overhead, which is a different definition. This is this money is for direct services. This pays for the people who will go and find those people who are homeless and provide them with shelter, food, water, and get them into our programming so that they can get into permanent housing. So you have to pay for that. So I don't, I don't want to sit here and have to defend that. Um, that's what this program is all about. That's what Metro Bond is all about. That's what we've been planning for for three years to do. So. I don't really know how to get to it. If you think it's too much money, we don't think it's enough money going into this effort. There are a lot of homeless people. It costs money to get this doing. And this is infrastructure. If you don't build the infrastructure, we're going to continue to put Band-Aids on this thing called homelessness and never fix it in Clackamas County. That's my opinion. OK, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rod, for the clarification. This is not for administration. This is for direct services. And I just want to remind my board that this county went through a very Clackamas-specific planning, which included wraparound services that were client-centered, which would meet people where they are, and then provide a whole continuum of services from transitional shelter to um, rent assistance in housing. I also want to um, mention that this board, this board approved our local implementation plan, which includes hotel, motel. We did not, this board did not ever make a vote on not having that be part of the continuum, very, very important part of the continuum. So I just wanted to make those two points. You said it much better than I could, but it's very important that we understand that we have a responsibility. The voters approved the homeless services measure as a region to be deployed to really help people that are unsheltered so that we can stop this, you know, intervene in this crisis. And we have a responsibility to work with our local nonprofits to deliver on that responsibility. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, um, I concur with uh, Commissioner Fisher's comments, um, and I do agree. My interpretation of this was not for administrative, but direct services, so I don't, I, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, I do think it's important for me to take this opportunity and say that um, my only concern is that we are actually transitioning these folks to a better place. My concern, and I'll repeat myself as, as long as I have to, that without um, drug, alcohol, and mental health treatment, we are not going to be, we, we are not giving these people hope. 
and getting them really to transition to a better place if they're still going to be dependent upon their, their, their needs, their habits. And those habits are expensive, and if they don't have the resources to do it, then they're going to find a way to get those resources, and that's my concern. Thank you so. very much, Commissioner. See no further objection for this. Um, continue, but <clears throat> a point of order here. I see Jeffrey Munns is in the audience. He is our acting county counsel today in Stephen Madcourt's absence. Will you come please sit at uh, the chair over there in case any of the commissioners have a question on legal matters. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, would you please continue? No, item number two, approval of a personal services contract with Impact Northwest to provide supporting housing case management and shelter and care services and assignment to Clackamas County. Contract value is $602,336. Funding is through Metro Supportive Housing Services. No county general funds are involved. Yes, and in this particular one uh, with Impact Northwest, uh, provide support, supportive housing case management to approximately 75 households and shelter ca plus care services to approximately 41 households. Any questions or comments? Seeing no objections, thank you. All right, item number three, adoption of resolution number 1969, delegating authority to finalize the terms of, of execute, acknowledge, and deliver the actions and documents as reasonably may be required for a loan to the Merrill Hurst Commons Affordable Housing Development in Lake Oswego. Loan value is $3 million to be repaid over 60 years. Funding is through regional, the regional affordable housing bonds. No county general funds are involved. Now, we've had this issue in front of you before, and I brought Devin because this is the very complex piece that we're doing over in um, Wilson, so I'll have her speak to him. Good morning, commissioners. Um, so we're, we're bringing this back to you. Um, the, the funding has already been approved, but we wanted to provide the near final loan documents um, for your review just so that you could get comfortable with delegating signing authority um, and you know, get a chance to read uh, the documents that'll be needing signature. Um, and the reason we need this is these are very complex transactions that come together at the latest hour. Um, there's documents that need notarization, um, that need to be recorded. And um, I, I was hoping that Andrew Naylor could be here today because he was with me um, representing the housing authority on the Maple Apartments transaction. And he was able to you know, really see the process firsthand and, and agrees that delegating signing authority for these types of deals is necessary. And I know he, he updated Jeff. Um, so if, if there's any so questions. My um, question is <clears throat> the procedure on this. Why is this a loan? Regional affordable housing bond, that's a metro bond that they uh, referred to voters several years ago. So why are we borrowing money on this? Uh, we are loaning it to the partnership, and the reason it's I structured see. as a loan is because I of the- I stand corrected, okay. thank you. So we're loaning it to them yes. based on money that's coming in from the bond. Correct. So, what ha so we were in a situation where we did this and we had to forgive the loan. So my question is, again, why are we loaning money to this? Is it because money is coming in slower than expected, or this is how it was designed to begin with? Um, it's structured as a loan. Um, it's essentially a grant, but we structure it as a loan um, because of the uh, low income housing tax credits and the, the equity investors tax liability. So essentially, Metro gives the funds to the housing authority at closing. It's in our, our bank account. And then we, um, you know, release the funds to the project through a, a construction draw process. So they request monthly funds from us, and we pull from that pot. Okay, but you said it goes for 30 years. Um, you said... <clears throat> well, the, the loan, the, the affordability agreement tied with these funds is, is a 60-year affordi affordability period the, the amortization period on the loan is 55 years. I think it's very confusing because you say it's essentially a grant, but it's a loan, so I'm not sure if it's an apple or an orange on this. Uh, I think it's, it, it's, this is very complicated. It, it is, and um, so essentially, you know, Metro is, is providing the funds to the housing authority to support the project, 
we are loaning the funds to the partnership. Um, they you know, pay the loan over a 55-year amortization period at 1% interest. If they extend their affordability period for an additional 30 years, so 90 years of affordability, then the loan is forgiven. Okay, my question is this. If we are being given the funds by Metro, why are we loaning them? Why aren't we also granting them? Yes. Is it because of the construction mechanism involved? No, it, it's simply because of the low-income housing tax credit structure that the, the equity investors, if they receive a grant, then it's considered taxable income. So they like to receive the funds as a soft loan, they call okay. it. All righty. Any other questions? Chair Smith, just a comment. You asked such excellent questions. I love it. Ann Leinstra and I were part of a board training for housing authorities where we spent four days literally going through and learning all of these complex, and it is very complex. And Devin, you were amazing to really narrow it down that simply, because is Anne on this call right now? She is. Okay, so Anne and I were there, and it was a lot in four days. So you just did that in, I think, three minutes. I am I'm amazed. Thank, thank you, you very much. Any other questions on this? Seeing no objections, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if we can convene as a development agency? Uh, we will now recess as a housing authority of Clackamas County and convene as a development agency. All right, I have Dan Johnson coming up. Number one is approval of a per personal services contract with Harper, Hoff, Peterson, Regalis, Inc. for administration services for the Linwood Avenue Improvement Project. Contract value is $805,797. Funding is through the North Clackamas Revitalization Area Urban Renewal District. There are no county general funds involved. Dan. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Smith, board. Should I say Administrator Bush? No, I shouldn't say that. Anyway, um, hey, we're here today to talk about a possible contract. Uh, this is for our Linwood project that the development agency is currently under design. That project is under design through a contract with Harper Hop, Pearson, Regalis. Um, essentially, the project is expected to be advertised for construction bids in the fall of 2022 with construction contract execution expected in December or January of this upcoming year. Essentially, uh, the contract we are looking or we are presenting before you today is a product of um, a lot of work we're doing. Uh, there are a lot of projects under construction. Um, this particular project, um, we, didn't ha we don't have staff capacity to do all the things associated with it. And so essentially we've asked Harper Hoff uh, to submit a bid for work including inspection services, construction engineering, construction staking, uh, contractor utility coordination, preparations of record drawings, and a post-construction survey. That total fee is the number before you today. Um, the PAX request uh, package was submitted to procurement on July 12th, 2022. Uh, it was posted with a notice of intent to purchase on July 14th with a closing date of July 21st and there were no objections filed. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have um, about this particular contract. Questions or comments? Any objections? Seeing none. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. So Chair Smith, if we could convene as the Water Environmental mm -hmm. Services. I will now recess as a development agency and convene as a water environment services. All right, thank you. Number one is approval of amendment increase me, increasing funding and modifying scope of work for a public improvement contract with Goodfellow Brothers for the Tri-City Water Resources Recovery Facility Fill Removal Project. Amendment value is $640,875. Contract value is now $1,303,375. Uh, funding is through the Water Environmental Services Sanitary Sewer Construction Funds. No general county funds are involved. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, good morning, Chair Smith and Commissioners. Uh, Greg Geist, Director of Water Environment Services. So this is a contract that we awarded in early July for the removal of a large amount of fill um, on the southern end of our property that resulted from uh, construction back in 2010-11. Uh, initially, uh, we estimated the amount of volume there. Uh, we awarded the contract. We thought it was about 30,000 cubic yards. Um, then we interfaced with the city to get the final grading permit. And we learned that at the time they spread that, or yes, yeah, put that dirt out there, they spread it out over five acres um, and then put a pile in the middle. 
we thought the pile in the middle was what we had to remove, but it turns out it's all it's double the amount that we thought. So we're on a cubic yard basis with this company. Um, it's unfortunate we didn't get our math right, but um, we'd like to amend the contract so we can finish the work. Uh, as of today, we've moved about 25,000 cubic yards. We've got about 40 to go. Yeah, I was down at your tour, and I see you pointed out that big pile of dirt, and there was a company out there already removing that. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Savas? Yeah, I specifically remember this conversation. Like you said, it was July, not that long ago. Yeah. Um, I just kind of stunned that we would miss it, had that big of a miss. Well, like I said, it, it, was, uh, it was spread out over five acres. We thought it was just a pile. Essentially, the people that were here back in 2010 when that are no longer here, um, so we just didn't know. We did. Next time we would get the final grading permit before we award the contract, we, we were fairly confident that we knew what was there, and we just weren't. I will say, you know, if we had known, we would, we've always had to move the same amount of material, whether we did it five years ago, 10 years ago, or yesterday. It's just that we initially underestimated. Thank you. Commissioner Scholl. Yes, uh, Mr. Geis, uh, how is this uh, extra $640,000 going to affect other projects uh, that are going to be affected by your sewer construction fund? We have contingency. Um, we'll take it out of that. Okay. It shouldn't be material impact, no. Okay. Commissioner Fisher? Yes, I'm just curious. If we would have known it was over the five acres instead of the one spot, we would have awarded initially a larger contract because the cost to move, you say a cubic? Cubic yard. Cubic yard. A yeah. cubic yard is going to be, that's how much, that's how the cost is determined by how many cubic yards are. Right. So we just extend the contract more cubic yards. And I will say, so the initial contract was 600,000 with Goodfellows. The other two bids were right around a million. So um, we're comfortable going forward with Goodfellows rather than stopping and going out or, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hearing no objections to this. Okay. Item number two, approval of a public improvement contract with Orr Inc. for construction of the maintenance access platforms project. Contract value is 171 thousand fifty dollars funding is through water environmental services sewer sanitary sewer construction funds and no county general funds are involved thank you uh, yeah th so this is at our tri-city facility really just a safety and efficiency project we're installing some platforms and some ladders to make it easier to get to and service equipment right pretty straightforward is this permanent yes uh, any objections to this seeing none okay item number three Approval of public improvement contract with R.L. Reimers Company for construction of the Bolton Pump Station Rehab and Upgrades Project. Contract value is $1,049,975. Funding is through Water Environmental Sur Services Sanitary Sewer Contract Funds. No county general funds are involved. All right, so this you've seen a few of these recently. This is a, another pump station that we're rehabilitating. New pumps, new instrumentations, new controls, new variable frequency drives. Um, uh, this one's in West Lynn. It's a Bolton pump station, and we are replacing two small pumps or two large two <laughs> two small pumps and a large pump to th three equal pumps. Um, anyway, it will give us the co firm capacity for 2040, and upgrade the pump station. Questions or comments? Yeah, so, how much you mentioned up to 2040? So, how much growth potential is anticipated? I, I don't know the answer. That's our that's our planning horizon. That's the the um, population forecasting numbers that we use and the cities generally use. Um, I don't know what what growth we're specifically we're expecting in West Lynn that would feed to this pump station, but our engineers certainly would. Yeah, I thought that this was a West Lynn pump station owned and operated pump station. No. So this is one of the original pump stations that when when the district was formed and the um, uh, treatment plants were decommissioned. Wes built and owns and operates the the pump stations that would convey what had gone to that treatment plant. Could you get back to me on the numbers of, of capacity built into that number when you sure. say 2040? Yeah. Thank you. Seeing no objections to moving forward on this. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.
right. If we can reconvene as the uh, county commissioners, we'll continue with the consent agenda items there. Now we'll recess as the Water Environment Services and reconvene as the Board of County Commissioners. Nancy. All right. First up, we have the Sheriff's Office, and I think we have Mike Morasco here for that. <coughs> Approval of an inter intergovernmental agreement and with the Greater Oregon Watershed Council to provide community service work crews. Amendment value not to exceed $50,000 over five years. Funding is through Greater Oregon Watershed Council. No county general funds are involved. Mike? Yes, thank you, Nancy. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Smith and Commissioners. Uh, as Nancy said, Clackamas County Sheriff's Office is requesting your approval to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. Uh, this agreement provides up to $10,000 annually to CCSO for supervised offender work crews. The crews are going to be working on landscaping projects, graffiti removal, and cleaning services um, for properties owned by the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council. Um, the revenue provided under this agreement will help offset the cost of running the parole and probations community services program. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next we have Juvenile. We have Christine McMahon here today from Juvenile. Uh, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Clackamas Education Service District to fund county staff providing youth workforce innovation and Opportunity Act services. Agreement value is $43,000 for one year. Funding is through Clackamas Education Services District. No county general funds are involved. Christina? Good morning, Chair Smith, Commissioners, Christina McMahon with the Juvenile Department. I am here to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the Clackamas Education Service District. This is an agreement that we have had in place for the previous nine years, and it provides funding through the Work Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act to allow us to provide services to youth who are juvenile justice involved uh, between the ages of 16 and 24 in our county. Um, and it provides educational connection, GED support, mentoring, internships, apprenticeships, job preparation, job skill development. It's, it's been a very successful program in our department and a great partnership with CEST. So we would like your approval to have this IGA go forward and we'll continue to offer these services to youth in our county. Questions or comments on this? See no objections. Thank you. Great. Right. Thank, Thank you. you, Christina. Next, we have to finance. We have Elizabeth Comfort here, the director. Number one is approval of a board order authorizing a purchase order to Oracle America Inc. for PeopleSoft Enterprise Resource Planning and Human Resources Information Management Software Maintenance <coughs> Services. Purchase order value is five hundred forty-six thousand five hundred and fifty six dollars for one year funding is through departmental cost allocations and approximately one hundred eighty two thousand one hundred eighty five dollars in budgeted county general funds thank elizabeth. you good morning chair and commissioners i'm elizabeth comfort finance director and with me i have dave devore our interim ts director because uh, uh, ts is really the one that uh, manages our software so this is renewal uh, for peoplesoft which is owned by oracle america we've been using peoplesoft since 1990 eight ninety nine and this is an annual uh, renewal for the maintenance of about 15 modules and I'm pretty excited about this because we are activating some of these modules and um, this year and next year and so we're really getting uh, um, good use out of the software I think PeopleSoft is adequate and uh, very good for the county as, as large as we are this is the software we need so I ask for your permission to continue um, for maintenance for the next coming year Commissioner Shaw. Yes. Um, this uh, the price of this um, five hundred and forty-six thousand dollars for one year. Now you've been using this software for a number of years. <coughs> My question is, today, twenty twenty-two, is it still a good deal? In other words, is could you consider this to be a competitive price? in the market for such services? Yes, and if we were to go out again, I believe that if we um, had different software today, it would cost us more annually. I can't quantify how much that would be, but yes, because we are longtime users of the software. Okay, yeah, that's expensive, but a little levity. At the fair, 
I, an elephant here is 10 bucks this year, so <laughs> everything's expensive. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That's true. Commissioner Fisher, you're up. Oh, my gosh. You had an elephant ear at the fair, Commissioner Shaw. I really wanted to get one, but I, I resisted. So when I became a new commissioner, this issue of, of um, Oracle and PeopleSoft, it came up, and there was talk about, is this the best going forward? And we were in a contract that was for a long duration. I'm interested in this coming before us now because it looks like we are in this for one year. This is the cost. What is the terms of our contract with this software? Sure, we have um, we renew our license with them every five every five years, and then the maintenance is annually. So we were here a year ago uh, for the last fiscal year for the maintenance as well. So this is a reoccurring um, maintenance agreement with them. They okay. do not do multiple maintenance, but we do have five year license agreements. Uh, and you're right, when I even came here in 2000, uh, December 2019, there was a research um, uh, going on and we had consultants to determine if PeopleSoft was the right one or should we have a new uh, ERP, um, Enterprise Reporting uh, System. And we found, thanks to uh, Dave and his team, that PeopleSoft, we actually purchased in 99 these 15 approximate modules, but we hadn't activated them. So what we were looking for in other systems during this research, we found we already owned. Uh, and so we're very excited to keep the system, which is adequate and um, uh, what the county needs, and we are making it the robust system that it is by activating these modules. And what year are we in with this five-year licensing agreement? I think we're in the third year. Second or third year. Possibly, Possibly year the third year, okay. yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Seeing no objections to this, thank you. Okay. Item number two, a resolution acknowledging materials weaknesses weakness in internal control over compliance for fiscal year 2020 and describing corrective action in accordance with ORS 297.466. No fiscal impact, no county general funds are involved. Yeah, Elizabeth. thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Joseph Rosevear. He is our grant manager. Uh, he's been with us since August and I uh, have him here as our uh, subject matter expert, but uh, I also wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to him. He is, he oversees our single audit. The county finance department has two different audits every year. One is our fiscal audit, financial reporting that you're familiar with. We call that the ACFR, formerly CAFR. And then we also have uh, a single audit. The county has approximately over a uh, hundred million dollars in federal grants each year and you see those come to you um, from the departments and so we have a CIFA which is a schedule of expenditures of federal awards audit also known as the single audit I'm not sure why they call it a single audit uh, because it's there's multiple grants and um, anyway we had to open up the CIFA uh, report from 2020 due to uh, a grant that we found had not been um, called out or identified on that schedule. And that was for, it was for Wes, but unfortunately it was in finance that we did not record that grant for a clean water services revolving funds. And that's a cluster of grants that we get from DEQ. And I have Joseph here to correct me, please butt in if I misstate anything. Uh, and um, Back when it was given to us in August of 2020, the grant was actually for five, approximately five million. And then this last spring, they sent a correction letter, which we don't have to you. I'm just giving you the story. So I apologize about all this information now, um, that the grant was actually available for 11 million. So this prompted us to need to open the 2020 CIFA schedule of expenditure grant report and restate it correctly. So that is what we have here today is this is a, a um, it was a finding of material weakness and uh, of our internal controls that and well, we can all remember what was going on in uh, the fall of 2020 in our lives here. And we had some staff um, changes and uh, some passing of the batons, and this unfortunately was omitted. Uh, we do know about it, and we actually have Erin Blue from Wes here in the audience that she can speak to that everything was handled properly. We just missed in finance putting that on the schedule. So we are correctly um, uh, calling that out, and we've already submitted back to the, the 
Secretary of State and uploaded the uh, corrected CIFA report. So all is good, but we do need to bring it to you and ask for your support in our correction that we have um, going forward. Thank you for finding that, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I can see the difference between about four or five million dollars between 111 million and 107. But I, what I'm more curious about is why this is not under the auspices of the district. Um, all of our component units, which include uh, the West District, roll up into um, Clackamas County. So all of our grants through all of those component units come together. And when you open our our act for our financial statements, you'll also see West reported in that too. So we, NCPRD, all those come together and they are, they're managed by our Clackamas County fi uh, Finance Department Grants Division. So that's how the, the umbrella works. So they manage the grant, but it, the reporting comes through the Finance Department. Okay, well maybe I'll just word it a little bit differently. Okay. I'm still confused because we have a separate audit for each of the districts, correct? Correct, for the component units as well as for Clackamas County as a whole. Right, and so West made up of three, three districts, uh, and this affects which district? And this, this affected West for the financial statement audit. Everything was properly accounted for in there. This just related to the single audit portion being included on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards, where it was excluded from that. But from an activity standpoint, all the activity was properly reflected in the in Wes's financials as well as for Clackamas County. So there's two different reports. One is our financials and it was included in that. It was the schedule of like, we're asked through the CIFA report, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards is to list out all of our, it's like an audit of all of the federal awards that we have. <coughs> this particular group was omitted from that list. Correct. And yeah, to add some context, it related to a revenue secured loan with Oregon Department of Environmental Quality in there. And so as those funds come in and are expended, then they the federal funds show up on the CIFA there. And then because it relates to a loan in future years, beginning balances of the loan would also be included on the CIFA. So we've taken corrective action in 20, to correct fiscal year 2020, the year ending June 30, 2020 now, in the schedule of expenditures of federal awards, as well as taking corrective action to make sure that internal controls are continue to be strong in capturing everything for this, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards going forward. Okay, well, I won't. I won't belabor this. I'm. I'm actually still not sure. When you say our, you know, we have two entities, the county and the, the district, right. and, and you're not sure which district was actually affected of the three. I'm not sure your question. Of the water environmental services. Yeah, water environmental services is three districts. Right? We merged them into one district three years ago. The Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, okay, so it's two districts then, as if it's shared then. But Sorry, my, my, my point's still the same, is that our is two different entities. Now, not the, not the districts themselves, but the district and the county. So I'm just kind of, again, I won't belabor it. I'll, I'll just ask maybe for further discussion on why it's not in its own autonomous house of West. Commissioner, I think I can answer that for you. It's because it's a component unit of the county. It's a county service district, much like NCPRD. Those all get reported on this, this mm -hmm. single audit that he's discussing. That's why they are managed separately as county service districts, you know, but they're still a component unit of the county for accounting purposes. Mm -hmm. That's why. So these districts still remain, and in this case, they make up the ORS 190 entity that the assets have been transferred into. But for accounting purposes, this is why they're handled this in this manner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's a staff recommendation that the Board of County um, Commissioners approve a resolution acknowledging material weaknesses in internal controls for fiscal year 2020 and describing corrective action in accordance with ORS 297.466. Following that on page 3 is a resolution. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I will entertain a motion. 
adopting that resolution. Oh, uh, consent agenda. Is that, is that what we're doing here today? That's for yeah. consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. I, not, I, yeah, that's fine. So when we approve it on Thursday or the next time? Tomorrow. It would be approved tomorrow. Okay, approved tomorrow. I'm just reading the staff report. Sorry about that. Okay, so we'll do that on Thursday, which is tomorrow. Okay, all righty. Um, any further questions or objections to this moving forward? Seeing none, thank you very much. Item number three, approval of an amendment extending the duration increasing funding to a contract with TVW for janitorial services at county facilities. Amendment value is $227,967 for two months. Contract value is increased to $6,892,382 for five years and two months. Funding is through departmental cost allocations and approximately $68,400 in budgeted county general funds. Elizabeth? Thank you. Uh, again, um, I'm here to present this uh, contract amendment. But I have with me Daniel Robertson. He is our... Uh, What's your title? Operations manager. Operations manager. He does so much uh, for our facilities department. So I have him here in case there's particular questions. But we've started renewal of this uh, janitorial contract with TVW uh, back in March. And because of the space planning um, changes in how folks have operated within their locations and the different uh, levels of services that we're we're looking to improve of our cleaning. There's been a lot of negotiations and staffing issues also with TVWD trying to get a, a good program and it's just taken longer. It is working with um, procurement, um, but we've, we're about down to the, to the very end, but the deadline, or the, excuse me, the contract expired June 30th and this amendment is in place to get us through August 31st, and so this keeps us in compliance with our audit, or excuse me, with our contract if we can have a two-month extension uh, approved by you today or tomorrow through consent. Mr. Shaw? Yes, that gives you two weeks to come up with a new contract. Is that correct? They've been, it's in progress right now. We're just not to the final end to get it signed, and so we just need this additional time uh, to wrap up the, the new contract. So it's just taken a lot longer mm -hmm. and is working with county council and with procurement to make this happen. Okay, thanks. Any further questions or comments? Seeing no objections, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next, we have transportation and development. We have Dan Johnson, the director. Number one, approval to apply for a bridge investment program discretionary transportation grant to replace the Bull Run River Bridge. Grant value is $11,509,700. 20% matching, matching funds of $2,877,425 funded from the county road fund. And warehouse will contribute to $10,000 towards this project. Total project value is $14,397,125. No county general funds are involved. Thank you so much. You. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate all of you. You have a bridge that's 129 years old, <laughs> um, a sufficiency rating of two out of 100, which is second place in the state, um, but still not great. We continue to look for money to replace the Bull Run Bridge. Um, PGA sent out notice that we were not successful um, with the raise grant application that we put forward. We are here to put forward an additional request um, for the replacement of that bridge. Um, and so I would be happy to answer, well, there's two things. One, the request is to put this forward for the board's consent. There are two components to it, um, one of which is um, s executing and signing the grant request, and second, there is a letter of support there we'd like to submit with the requ request as well. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, what federal department is this through? The grant. Uh, I assume. Well, it's, it's through... Um, Federal, um, Federal Transportation Department was part of the investment, um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was recently passed. I tell you, this bridge has been extremely problematic in us getting funding, and we've tried and tried and tried and tried to do this. Hopefully this will be successful. I want to thank you for identifying this. Yet another possible resource, and I'm just going to reiterate, uh, Clackamas County has made grant applications through various federal 
uh, agencies, and we have been summarily rejected about almost every time we turn around, not just transportation projects, but other projects as well. So I don't want to raise hopes and expectations that we're going to be successful on this. But there's always the outside chance. Do you have a question, Commissioner? No, but I want to say good job on getting 129 years out of that bridge. That's a good investment. If you can get that kind of a service out of everything else we build, you're going to get an award. <laughs> <laughs> that is a return on investment. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but basically this is a section of the Burnside Bridge, the old Burnside Bridge, that they're now looking to replace because it's become obsolete. Because so. they took that Burnside Bridge and they put it out here. Yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, Commissioner Savas? Well, we made several attempts for grant applications on this bridge, and um, it is mostly served, mostly serves the city of Portland and their water bureau yep. um, and warehouser. And so... Uh, the fact that we have not been able to get funding and we've asked for our federal assistance. You know, we just opened a bridge going over I-84, um, a bike, bike ped bridge uh, to the tune of $19 million. And uh, this bridge ranks so poorly and it serves Portland. It just stuns me that we haven't been successful and haven't got adequate support for it. Um, maybe I'm just kind of wondering, I'm not being, I'm not joking about this, but is it possible we could add a, a bike ped element to this bridge to, to better qualify? For funding, <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth on that. No, no, I'm, I'm actually, I'm absolutely, I'm actually serious. I mean, it, it, I, is it, is it possible that if there was a bike ped element to this bridge, it, we would better qualify to get it funded? I think you can answer that later. Why don't you do? Well, we'd have to look to at the grant criteria. That, that, that's a, that's a, a question that depends on what the criteria are for the particular grants, and if there are, as you see, many jurisdictions at play right now who are adding those facilities because it makes it more. Um, competitive in that grant process. Um, I don't believe Schrader, that's the case yeah. in this one, though. Mr. Schrader and I will be in Washington, yeah. D.C., talking to our federal delegation on many issues, and I'm certain this will come up as please support this grant application and help City of Portland's water supply. We should not bear the onus of this at all, and we're using how much of our own road fund, two point over $2.8 million of our own road fund to make sure the city of Portland has water, and yet they have no interest whatsoever in trying to help us on that. I think that is really criminal on the part of our partners to the north. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Seeing no objections. Chair, to, yes. I, I wasn't finished. I didn't see your, I didn't yeah. see your line. Yeah. And yeah. commissioners, I'm just going to say this. The words on here are not what your seating assignments are. So I look at this and I see a different name. So I need to pause and say, oh, that's not Commissioner Shaw. That's com not Commissioner Schrader. And so I am a little bit delayed on this, just so you know. Thank you very much. Yeah, no much. worries. I turned my light on, but I wasn't finished. That's fine. Uh, yeah, that's why I turned it on the second time. Um, Dan, um, it ranks two out of how many points? 100. Out of 100. <laughs> so at what point does it qualify for closure? Because we, we have a we have a we're going to be liable for any kind of collapse or you know whatnot, and it seems to me that's not really responsible for us to keep it open, frankly, if it's if it ranks that poorly and we're putting people at risk. Um, that's a discussion I'd have to get back in um, that information to you. Fundamentally, it ranks poorly. Um, I believe we have weight limits on it now. Um, there are steps that we take to ensure a safe um, bridge and transportation system. Um, which include, like I just said, reference like weight restrictions and things of that nature. Um, I'm not aware of an um, imminent um, threat on this particular bridge in regards to its current structural safety. I will tell you there have been some interesting components to that bridge. We had a section of the asphalt fall out, and it's like, hey, I can see the river from the top of the bridge. That's probably not a good spot to be in. And we've been done repairs on it um, and been diligent in that. But um, it, it would basically have to come through a discussion around the weight limitations associated with it or its fundamental structural failure somewhere. So if there's some aspect to the abutment that is failing or there is some aspect to the um, um, uh, girder system associated with it that was failing that would be a structural component, that would more than likely be the trigger. But I can get more information on that for you. Well, it just seems like our engineers that evaluated the bridge and ranked it have put a stamp on it, right? Correct. And I believe that's the state of Oregon. Okay, state of Oregon. Yeah. So it seems to me that it would be incumbent upon whoever stamp is on that to say, you know, at some point, if the question is posed to them, and maybe it should come from us, comes to the Board of County Commissioners, what is 
the point in time in which you close this bridge? And uh, to me, an engineer should answer that and, oh, yeah. and, there, and, and stamp it accordingly. Uh, I mean, so the ranking system is set up, and, I, and Mike, Mike was here, he could probably answer all this stuff, but we'll get back to you, more information to you on that. Yep. He, lives for, like he that, lives for bridges. I would like that information before we head uh, to D.C. And yeah. we, we can say, we're going to close the bridge. And I don't know how you folks are going to access repairs on the Bull, Bull Run water uh, area for your city, but, you know, we have done everything. We applied for I don't know how many multiple grants. Hopefully PGA is listening. How many times have we sought funding and been turned down? Yeah. And, and it's a valid question, I believe. Yeah, and you mentioned PGA. We should call it out the partnership we have with them in putting forward these requests. With who? With PGA. Uh, PGA is a partner as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Seeing no objections to this, thank you for identifying this grant and trying to work out this problem. Thank you. Item number two, approval to apply for a safe street and roads for all grant with the U.S. Department of Transportation for implementing a safe systems transportation safety project on Stafford Road. Grant value is $6,307,576, matching funds of $1,530,761, funded from the County Road Fund. Total project value is seven million eight hundred thirty-eight thousand three hundred thirty-seven. No county general funds are involved. Thank you. Um, safety is important to Clackamas County, essentially along these corridors, such as Stafford Road. Um, what you see is a uh, grant request that has two components to it. One component are physical improvements, and if you look on. Uh, page two of your staff report, it identifies those sections of Stafford Road and what will be completed on those sections of Stafford Road associated with the physical improvements. Then also it talks about a um, educational outreach uh, for, that aligns with the county's drive to zero goals and objectives. Uh, the program um, has a mission to eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes by 2035. Uh, this educational outreach will primarily focus on rural road users uh, to reduce speeds, particularly in and out of curves uh, where we have the greatest challenges on, on this particular stretch. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions or comments? What did you say there was a, to, for us to look at Stafford Road, where is that in the materials? It's on page two of the staff report. So basically, if you see under the background, it talks about this traffic safety improvements and the following measures we provided on the following three segments of Stafford Road, 65th Avenue to, Fro okay. to Frog Pond. Okay, I see. Okay, yep. thanks. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Shaw. Dan, is this, uh, does it come about because of um, worries about diversion on Stafford Road if and when tolling happens, or is, it, is this something that you're doing regardless of what tolling? We're doing regardless of what tolling. Uh, Stafford Road can, and other roads as well, and we'll bring in other projects forward as well. There are certain sections of roadway that are historically, um, in all honesty, there are, there are rural roads that intersect between urban hubs, and so you have that intersection of urban driving on these rural road sections. This has to be one of those particular roadways. We have high, high speed incidents that occur here individuals going off the roads, et cetera, um, intersection improvement um, or sa intersection safety issues that we're looking to address as well. Uh, any other questions or comments? Seeing no objections, thank you. All right, item number three, approval of a board order authorizing a purchase order for Nelson truck equipment to purchase one new Ford F550 4x4 truck with utility body and man lift. Purchase order value is $176,993. Funding is through designated Clackamas Broadband Exchange ARPA funds. No county general funds are involved. Uh, fleet has been requested to purchase this particular vehicle. Um, I noticed you skipped all the fine details about the kind of tr or the truck and all that. That's great. But um, <laughs> if you have questions about that, we'll be glad to hear. I'd be glad to answer them. Pardon me, I wouldn't be glad to answer them. We have indiv individuals from Broadband and our fleet management staff that can answer any questions you might have. I will draw your attention, though. Um, there were three bids received. Um, if you look at the procurement process on page one, there were three quotes received. Pardon me. Um, two of them were um, um, unable to meet the requirements of uh, our returning incomplete quotes. And so essentially the one quote we got was from Nelson's um, truck and basically it was found in the best interest of the county to purchase the quote of vehicle. I did um, have a discussion with uh, 
uh, Warren Gadbury, our fleet manager, around the pricing, and they said the pricing was appropriate as well. Uh, most of the other quotes and bids associated with that were associated with delivery time, I believe, um, and supply chain issues that we're all facing. So with that, I say I would be glad to answer any questions you might have. That probably isn't the case if you're asking specifics about the truck, but with that. This is for the IT department to install uh, what this board voted on, additional broadband into underserved or unserved rural areas in Clackamas County. You initially look at a Ford pickup at a, that much money, but it's obviously equipped with a lot of doodads on it to do the work. My technical term there. Very, very correct. Yes, uh, Commissioner Sabas. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually. I just like to better understand what the purpose is. Um, you know, because of the ARPA money, maybe it's a detail that's uh, not a big deal. But it just seems to me that um, I can see where broadband being aerial hung. We need a truck like this. So I get that. But I don't know how that is specific to this. The, the intent of the ARPA money that was granted for expanding broadband service. So maybe TS could explain that, how it's, is it specific to this project or is it something that helps the entire broadband um, facilities around the county? I'm going to ask staff be brief on this if you want to come explain or you can put it in writing. Commissioners, we have a lot of consent agenda items left. And we seem to be rather talkative and inquisitive today. I'm going to ask you to hold questions unless they're hugely relevant because we have some major issues to discuss. And if you want to stay till 1 this afternoon, I'm perfectly fine with that. But I'm just going to ask to be brief going forward on, on, on all this, including myself. Okay, can that question be answered through an email? Yes. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Uh, because I think we're going to go ahead and prove this regardless of what the specs or requirements are or what it does or use of ARPA funds on that. So no objections. I appreciate your question, Commissioner Savas. That is interesting. But hey, we need to move through the agenda today. If we don't get stuff done today, it will not be revisited until sometime in September. And we have a full week when we come back after Labor Day. We have a full week, and that is a shortened week. So I just want to try to manage the calendar, the time, and the schedule going forward. Thank you very much. Nancy, what's uh, Chair, next? just one thing you should know is that I have a noon meeting I'm chairing, so I'll have to exit here at noon or before noon. <clears throat> As will I. Well, commissioners, I'm going to say this, and I've said before. Your very first duty, your primary duty, is to be at this dais and pass the county business regardless of meetings. If we don't hear what needs to be heard today because we don't have a quorum, that will be put off for a very later date. But it's up to you. I just have to manage the schedule when we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Right. Nancy. All right. Thank you, Dan. Next, we have Health, Housing, and Human Services. And we have the Director, Rock Cook, here with us today. Number one is approval to apply for funding opportunity with Business Oregon for COVID-19 impact assistance programs for child care assistance. Grant value is $250,000 for one year. Funding through Business Oregon. No county, federal, federal, yeah, no county general funds are involved. Rod. Yes, this is a one-time opportunity funded through the uh, Federal CARES Act to respond to the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Business Oregon funds will allow low to middle income families access child care which in turn will assist them in finding and maintaining employment. Any questions or comments on this? See no objections. Okay, item number two, approval of an amendment extending the duration increasing funding and modifying the scope of work of a grant with Northwest Housing Alternatives, Inc. for home-based program operations and client financial assistance. Amendment value is $115,000 for one year. Grant value is now at $462,316 for four years. Funding is through budgeted county general funds. Yes, if approved, this would uh, fund client financial assistance, program case management, and administration to low-income families and individuals to access affordable housing or remain stably housed. Any questions or comments? See no objections. Okay. 
Item number three, approval of an amendment extending the duration of a grant agreement with the Oregon Department of Transportation to fund a pilot project for transit service along uh, the I-205 corridor. Agreement value remains at $900,000, but is now extended from two years to three years. Funding is through ODOT, Statewide Transportation Improvement Funds, Clackamas County Statewide Transportation Improvement Funds, and Washington County Committed Funds. No county general funds are involved. Yes, if approved, this transit connection would provide a missing link in transit for both Clackamas County and Washington County. The partners are looking to extend and connect current transportation options that would allow people to move from Bridgeport Village in Tualatin to Oregon City, West Lynn, and Clackamas Town Center, and additionally connect to critical services off Borland Road. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Uh, Chair. Uh, this was kind of important. So, Rod, do you know if this is just the H3S um, lift services portion of the project or the entire project? I don't know that. I'd have to get I'd have to get back to you on okay, that. Please, please do. Yeah. And, Thank you. And to me too. Okay. Thank you. Jerry, I one question. Commissioner Shaw. Mr. Cook, uh, this is a one-year extension, moving out to three years. So, when will this pilot project be done if this ex extension is approved? Uh, that I ask is that question because um, I, the date that it's going to be done now might become a point of interest for those of us looking at uh, mass transit uh, solutions to uh, reduce diversion when, when and if I-205 is to uh, told. So the date that this ends I think would be of interest. <clears throat> okay, I, I can you get can that get information that to us. for you. I yes. appreciate it. It states in the agreement that it is, it okay. extends it through December 30th of 24. Of 24. Okay. December of 24, you said. Correct. Thank you. Okay. See no objections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number four, approval of a subrecipient amendment extending the duration, increasing funding, modifying the scope of work, and adjusting budgeting of a federal subrecipient agreement with the city of Lake, Os Lake Oswego on behalf of its Lake Oswego Adult Community Center to provide client services, COVID support, nutrition services, health promotion, respite care, and transportation services to eligible individuals. Amendment value is $119,850 for one year. Grant value is now $254,727 for two years. Uh, funding is through the Older Americans Act, Ride Connection, and TriMet. No county general funds are involved. Yes, I think the acting administrator gave a pretty detailed description. <laughs> Unless there's questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Okay. Item number five: approval of a subrecipient sub amend amendment extending the duration, increasing funding, modifying the scope of work, and adjusting budgeting of a federal subrecipient agreement with the City of Sandy on behalf of its Sandy Senior Center, Senior and Community Center, to provide client services, COVID support, nutrition services, health promotion, energy assistance, and transportation services to eligible individuals. Amendment value is two hundred nine thousand nine hundred forty-seven dollars for one year, and grant value is now four hundred. $16,653 for two years. Funding is through the Older Americans Act, Rider Connection, TriMet, and Heat Oregon. No county general funds are involved. This, same as the previous. Uh, I can ask, answer questions if you have any. Seeing no questions or comments or objections, thank you. Item number six, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Health Authority for Community Restoration Services for individuals determined unfit to proceed to trial. Agreement value not to exceed $747,788. Funding through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. You know, I'll add a little bit on this one. Uh, Senate Bill 295 called for community mental health programs to utilize community restoration options for defendants not needing a hospital level of care. Funds can be used to create or enhance program and services that support individuals to remain in the community and out of the hospital. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number seven, approval of a federal subrecipient grant, grant with Central City Concerns for continuation for the law enforcement diversion program. Agreement value is $1,543,469 for one year, including $395,000 for county general funds. Funding is through U.S. Department of Justice, Metro, Supportive Housing Services, and budgeted county general funds. 
Yes, uh, since 2019, Clackamas County's law enforcement, Div Div law enforcement division program lead has improved community health and safety by diverting hundreds of individuals struggling with substance use disorder or from uh, the cr criminal justice system to case management services. LEAD strives to connect systems and initiatives to advance a comprehensive, coordinated response to the crisis of substance abuse in the county. And so we, um, that's it. Uh, questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number eight, approval of an amendment modifying the funding for fiscal year, of fiscal year 2022 for the intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Health Authority funding, the local public health authority for Clackamas County, agreement value remains at, at exceed $15,740,170 for two years. Funding is through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. Yeah, this, this was a housekeeping change in the uh, contract. So uh, per the state's directive in the amendment, the amendment is effective June 1, 2022 and continues through June 30, 2022 regardless of the date of, of the amendment and it, regardless of the date the amendment is fully executed. So this is basically to put language in there that needed to be to cover 30 days essentially and then it'll go on to the next. So like like I mentioned, it's it's housekeeping to add language that the state needed added into the contract, but it doesn't change any of the parameters. Okay. Seeing no questions or comments. Item number nine, approval of a local subrecipient sub grant agreement with Clackamas County Fire District to fund capacity for emergency medical services. Grant value is $75,000. Funding is through budgeted county general funds. Yeah, this is through the blueprint uh, for healthy Clackamas County. It's the county's um, external facing initiative to help coordinate, connect, and align priorities for partners. Uh, there's an emphasis on funding projects that will create coalitions in advancing health equity and trauma informed approaches with, within specific communities in Clackamas County. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item number 10, approval of assignment from the Housing Authority of a personal services contract with the Father's Heart Street Ministry to provide supportive services to households in hotel, motel-based emergency shelters. No fiscal impact. Contract value remains at $500,170 for one year. Funding is through Metro Supportive Housing Services. No county general funds are involved. And this is what we uh, talked about earlier. This is that assignment over to the new division so that it makes it legal on both sides. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections going forward. Okay. Number 11, approval of assignment from the Housing Authority of a personal services contract with Impact Northwest to provide supporting housing, case management, and shelter and care services. No fiscal impact. Contract value remains at $602,336. Funding is through Metro Supportive Housing Services. No county general funds are involved. Same issue here. It moves it from HAC over to the new division. Any questions or comments? Seeing no objections. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, we will be changing kind of some things around a little bit to um, for the interest of timing. But first, we do want to do the abandoned recreational vehicle removal update and plan. And we have Don, Dan Johnson and Scott Seco here. Thank you very much. Please introduce yourselves and proceed. We both like to talk. Who wants to go first? Since you've already been here, I'll introduce myself. Good morning, uh, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Scott Seco. I'm an Assistant County Counsel uh, here to talk about abandoned RVs and how the county is going to be dealing with them. Um, Dan Johnson, Director of Transportation and Development. So you asked us to develop a plan. Okay. We came developer together and we developed a plan. So. Um, a couple things. I want to make sure we highlight all this is in the report. This does not deal with every abandoned RV we have out there. This deals with abandoned RVs that are in rights of way. Okay. Um, does not deal with occupied RVs that are in these certain circumstances, set of circumstances. But what it does is it develops a, a great framework um, in which a number of departments and partners are working to kind of solve the problem. Um, I want to call those out really quick. Um, those are, because a lot of this problem solving is around how do you get funding um, to, to provide solutions, okay? Uh, sustain, DTD, sustainability and solid waste, water environment services, 
Um, you've got Metro, who is providing some grant funding to this particular project, facilitated through sustainability. Our road fund partners, Urban Renewal, um, and actually county administration through the general fund. And what you're going to see, um, one, there's a process that's described on page one and page two. And there's basically um, a revenue and expenditure discussion on the um, Excel spreadsheet on attachment A. You can see that we've identified the various funding sources that are out there. Um, you can see that I want to draw attention to a couple things, though. Um, one, on the revenue side, we talk about general fund. I want to highlight the fact that that's 150000 and it's up to, OK? Basically, the idea is to use other funding uh, to meet the needs that are out there. But if circumstances require, and it is a certain safety issue, um, then we will run those requests through our county administrator. I also want to highlight, and you can see that's for fiscal year 22-23. We estimate that revenue theoretically at $7,000 in RV could tow 60. We're aware of about 50 that are out there. Um, but they're, we're going to work with our neighborhood livability partners and CCSO. Pardon me. Partners also include CCSO. I'm, I apologize for the oversight. Um, they're going to be kind of the catch-all um, for, for um, um, documenting these RVs and where they're at to develop kind of a priority list. I do want to draw you to, uh, it also uh, talks about t fiscal year 23-24 funding, and there's some to be determines in there. One is what's the carryover. Um, this is not a program to go out there and just clean the streets and be done with it. It's to prioritize and use those dollars as efficiently and effectively as we can, because a lot of that money is one-time money. Okay, You're going to see some to be determines in there. I'm going to talk about two of them, and then I'm going to hand it over uh, to Mr. Seiko to talk about the third. The question is, what's the carryover from 2223? Because there will be some dollars that may, are not expended. What's that carryover to fund the program? And secondly, there's a discussion around general fund, which is a discussion that will come in front of this board. Are there additional general fund dollars you wish to provide to support this program um, in its current formation? And then I also noted in here there's a state funding discussion going on. It's the second item down. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Seco to kind of discuss um, um, dialogues he's having with partners at the state level. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dan. Uh, just by way of an update, there is uh, a relatively recently formed group, uh, statewide group, that is working uh, to come up with ideas and solutions towards this abandoned RV, RV issue because Clackamas County is obviously not alone. You see these everywhere you go throughout the state. And so this is a statewide issue. And so there is movement uh, finally towards a statewide solution. And so I have, uh, I'm actually participating now uh, on behalf of the county. I believe there's some other county partners, uh, county uh, staff people that are participating as well. We're giving input. And the goal at the end of all of this work group is to go to the legislature with a proposal for how to streamline the process and also how to get funding for the process. And that's certainly been the emphasis of, of my uh, uh, position on this work group thus far is saying that really it comes down to a funding issue. And so the hope there is that uh, there will be some of that in sight. It's in the early stages and certainly I can update you as progress occurs there. To date, to date we have we have actually had to move a number of vehicles. I want to make sure we're clear about that. We have made progress on a number, mostly the, those RVs that were a, a significant safety issue to the traveling public, where they were located in rights, directly in rights of way, creating safety issues, where they're blocking stop signs, um, et cetera, and those have been moved. This program will provide a more stable, I say one-time money, but at least a pot of money to start looking at a broader um, removal process with a partnership with Clackamas uh, County Sheriff's Office. Um, there's no particular ask today. We're just here to answer any questions you might have. You will be seeing, though, an IGA that we have, are finalizing right now with Metro for the $200,000. Um, it's actually, I think, a total of 265, I think. Uh, there's other money going to a couple of smaller other, other projects, but the majority is going to this program as well. You will see that IGA. We'll be bringing it forward to you um, in the next month or so. So Metro has agreed to that? Metro has granted us the, the request, yep. And we have fully funded this particular aspect. There were three aspects to it, but we fully funded the RV portion. Thank you. Now, let's talk about the general fund for a moment. <clears throat> 150000 in fiscal year 22-23. Is that general fund monies that are already in these departments? Because some of our departments were already performing this service. For instance, West was, DTD was, I understand. So is this? somewhat of a redundancy, or are we putting more general fund? 
those general fund, those dollars and those agencies that you're talking about, um, we have not used specific general fund from those programs to support this. These are actual specific asks that are made of the county administrator on a case by case basis where those other funding sources um, were not available to meet the need. Um, for example, at the end of the fiscal year last year, we had a number, number of sources for, for example, sustainability and solid waste had program $15,000 last year. Mm -hmm. Those dollars were running a little bit short. We had a certain situation with one particular one that had to be towed over the weekend. Um, the county administrator agreed um, to release some a small amount of general fund. There has not been a wave of general fund asks on this particular project so far, nor do I foresee them because we have the other funding sources in right. place. Yeah. So the general fund here would be used only when all other funds are exhausted. Exactly. And I see we have $20,000 down from our road fund. We do, and those are on a case-by-case, -case, mostly around when they're, sa again, safety-related. They have towed two to date. Um, there, there was a clear nexus between either the location of the RV, obstruction of signage, um, that were clearly um, tied to the, sa to the safety of our traveling public. And that's important when using those road funds when we make that nexus. Again, the discussion is more, and this is the coordination we're having with, with CCSO, County Council. Um, they're, they're collecting data on them when they're abandoned, where they're abandoned, what the status is, going out and field checking these to make sure they're abandoned. Then our role is basically, what's the proper funding source? If we're going to tow it and it's a priority, what what funding source is more appropriate in this particular sort of circumstances? And that's going to be done with the assistance of DTD financial staff, uh, DA Relan and her staff, in coordination with myself and others. So, um, yeah, thank you. So we've had a large public outcry to do something, and so in full disclosure, if anybody in the public is interested in this, they really need to take a look at attachment A in this document to see where the money is coming from because it is very expensive. Yes, um, public, we have heard you. We agree with you and we are willing to take monies out of separate funds, apply for grants to at least do the initial to get it done and then see what happens for the future. And I think um, the board would agree once we exhaust through these funds, we take a look, see for the future, see what's out there as uh, this is really kind of a fluid program with that in mind. Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's presumed um, by all of us here that these RVs that are towed away and are, are destroyed, they're not find their way back on the street again. That is a correct assessment. Okay, could that be spelled out? Is, is there any way they had that assurance either just spelled out or written that these are not to be returned back? I don't want to spend taxpayer dollars just to have it towed at a huge expense with the pain for the destruction of, but yet to find them back on the street. So, so Commissioner, I can respond to that. There's, there's actually state laws governing what happens when these abandoned vehicles are towed. There is a period of time in which somebody can come and collect them and redeem the RVs once they're towed. That person would have to pay the full towing costs and things of that nature. So if it is a situation where somehow somebody left something in the right of way that was a hazard, we had to tow it immediately, uh, and, but it was genuinely a situation where it was just Inadver it was left there because there was no other choice. People have a right to come back and collect their property. But yes, it's, if it's not collected within a certain time period, then absolutely these are being sent to our partner. We have a contract with called Rapid Response BioClean. Uh, they are licensed to properly dismantle and decommission these RVs. Okay, thank you. Good, good. Thank you for this. Any further questions from commissioners? Thank you for the report and uh, go forth and start towing. We'll thank report you. back to the commission on how the program goes. Yes, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you, Dan and Scott. Go ahead, Nancy. All right, up next, I would like to cover the agenda for tomorrow real quickly. Yes. That's okay. Um, we will have uh, the Housing Authority public hearing on the updates to the Family Self-Sufficiency Action Plan, our consent agenda, public communications, and then county administrator update, and the commissioner's communication. Does that meet with your approval? Yep. Yep. Right. Thank you. Sounds pretty light. All right. Um, so next, we're going to do the supporting housing services for the FY22 fourth quarter progress report. I believe this report is due on September 15th, so we wanted to make sure that we could get this information to you today. Um, and this is for information only. There is no ask of the commissioners. And this is the fourth, fourth quarter. Please introduce yourselves and go ahead. Hello, uh, Rodney Cook, uh, Health, Housing, and Human Services Director, and I have with me Vahid Brown. Good afternoon, or good morning, actually, still. Vahid Brown, Housing Services Manager with the uh, Housing and Community Development Division. 
And in lieu of time, I'll, I'll turn it right over to Vahid so we can get right to it. So if there's any questions, we can get those answered from the board. And thank you, Rod. And I'll, I'll also be brief. I just want to mention that this is the fourth quarter progress report for the Supportive Housing Services Program. We bring these quarterly reports to you at the time we submit to Metro for our, um, our intergovernmental agreement with them. It tracks the progress towards our local implementation annual plan goals and documents kind of the, the development of our infrastructure and the expansion of our programs and services as we ramp up this, um, this resource. A lot of great progress reported in this fourth quarter. A lot of great things happened in the fourth quarter. Um, just a couple of things to highlight. We opened at the very end of the fourth quarter the Tukwila Springs Permanent Supportive Housing uh, Development in Gladstone. It will serve older adults experiencing homelessness with disabilities uh, as well with a connection to Gladstone as well as 12 set-aside rooms for folks that identify as Native Americans that are experiencing homelessness. 36 of those rooms provide ongoing supportive services through the Supportive Housing Services Program. So that's a contribution that we've made in the fourth quarter to house the people, some of the most vulnerable people in Clackamas County and in Gladstone. Very exciting, beautiful building. We all saw it. It was uh, a really exciting opening day. Um, and then another highlight, just to, to briefly touch on, uh, the, the largest single investment in, in ending homelessness in Clackamas County was conducted in this quarter through the Supportive Housing Services measure. In one round of procurements, over $6 million were committed to ending homelessness for vulnerable people in our community. That's more than any other single-time investment in the history of our county in, uh, in making good on our commitment that homelessness in Clackamas County should be rare, brief, and not recurring. I'm going to stop there. Commissioners, go ahead. Commissioner Fisher. Oh, you know that I have questions? I do, I can tell. Oh my gosh, how do you know me so well? So thank you for the report, and um, I wasn't thinking you were going to be done so fast. But I want, I had some questions that were brought up, and I talked to Emily about them, so I think I might know the answer, but I'm not sure that I do. So I'm looking here at the report on page six. Yep. So the questions that have come to me from folks out in the community are, since we've received so many dollars, why have those dollars not been distributed out into the community? And in looking at this um, fiscal year 21-22, I see that the left amount on the remaining contract for just one of the areas, the biggest one, of emergency housing shelter transitional is 28. Oh, no, wait, that's 28,000. Okay, scratch that. So would you just comment on how we are moving forward with the distribution of the supportive housing services dollars? Yeah, that's, the, that's a great question. And, and the, you know, the expenditures that are, you know, kind of annotated in the FY21-22 totals at the bottom, you know, those are um, consistent with the, the advance from, from Metro and the, the cash flow considerations that can kind of constrained um, the, you know, rapid expansion of homeless services in the first year of programming, it was done in a ramp up way. And so we had to kind of, you know, spend only the money that we had and not money that we didn't have. Um, but the, the $6 million investment that I mentioned in that, that one procurement, that one round of procurement that was conducted, uh, you don't see those remaining executed contract values reflected here. Uh, you know, you're only now starting to see those contracts come to you. Two of them were mentioned by uh, Director Cook this morning. They'll be on your uh, consent agenda tomorrow. Um, in the next, uh, in September, when you return from recess, the, the um, balance of those contracts will come to you. We had to negotiate, draft the contracts, work with the providers. So when the procurement was conducted, we committed $6 million to those programming, uh, those programming areas. And that will begin once those contracts are executed. So not having been executed, they aren't reflected here. They were, they were commitments we made by letters of intent and uh, through the public procurement process. Um, we have plans that we've communicated to our, our partner community about further rounds of procurement to continue to roll out these dollars. So um, we're confident that we're going to continue to rapidly expand the pace of spending. Okay. And just as a follow-up, when I look at this chart on page six, fiscal year 21-22, the total expenditures has 3162000 which seems, since we've received in fiscal year 21-22, um, let's see, oh wait, this is really confusing. I don't understand this chart because now it says SHS measure disbursements is 35 million. 
So is that the income received? We have yes. received 35 million, then we had the advance, so that's a 40 million. Yes. So we received 40 million and we have expended, I just can't see that these numbers, these are all, numbers are not adding up in my um, understanding of what yeah. happened last fiscal year. Right, so the, in the, um, the revenue disbursements through the, the first three quarters were in very small increments. If you remember, they were in the hundreds of thousands. I think in one instance, one month was in the tens of thousands early in the disbursements. I think that was the, it was 30,000 and we said, wait, are, are you missing some zeros there? Um, and we only, the, the overwhelming majority of that $35 million came in the last three months, the last two months of the fiscal year and the first month of the, of the new fiscal year when the last month's collections of the last fiscal year were dispersed to us. So the, um, we did not have these funds on hand during the majority of the fiscal year, and um, the amount that we were uh, working with was the amount within the advance that was advanced to us in two different um, disbursements, a $3 million and a $2 million. Uh, and subsequent to the $2 million advance, we went ahead and, and planned for that l large round of procurements, conducted that, and now we're gonna move forward and continue to like execute those contracts. Um, but it's simply a, a function of the tax. You know, it, it, the, the, the bulk of the funds came in at the end of the year. That will support our, our programming activities through those lean next three quarters when we're not receiving monthly disbursements of significant amounts okay, of money. Okay, so we're using, this is the part that I think yeah. I understand. We're using the money that we received, most of it in the bulk of the fourth quarter of fiscal year 21-22. We're using those dollars as our funding moving into this next year. And that provides us financial stability, financial certainty, and ability for you to know which universe you're operating in as far as how much money is available for the next fiscal year. That's it, exactly. Okay, and this doesn't include our ARPA designation for hotel motel, and okay. So that's why the numbers don't add up, because I know that we, because. Yeah, the ARPA, we, yes, that we, was, that was two and a half million. From our homeless count, we have successfully housed almost a third from our homeless count, and that didn't happen without all the advanced resources and dedication that we had committed to this program. And um, I just wanted to make sure that our numbers were reflected. I mean, at least the explanation of the numbers was out there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Great, great. Commissioner Savas. Yeah. <clears throat> um, just want to say that the um, budget is commensurate with the amount of resources we have for supportive housing services. And I think it was 35 million, I recall, in being in the budget. So I'm glad to see we were able to pay the, the, the loans off. That was great um, so soon. And um, uh, we had, um, staff had up to available two $5 million tra tranches of loans or available through Metro that we got okayed, but we only had to use the five million as Vahid just laid out. Uh, Vahid, my question is in the metrics, and I know that it was a, um, it's a goal stated by several to identify um, the, the folks that we're helping, um, and I don't know what marker we use to do that, um, and so can you explain that a little bit so we can understand? I, see, I like to see the households, but how do we know the individual people and be able to track them in the future to know sure, make sure that they have got into permanent housing, yeah. be successful, and they stayed there, right? Yeah. That, yeah, that's a great question. And, and Commissioner Savis, we have a, a, a couple of different systems, but um, the Homeless Management Information System, or HMIS, is an individual level um, database of everyone who's who's receiving services through the homeless service system, and we're we're able to all of our uh, program partners that are delivering direct services through contracted um, services uh, are inputting information about the household they're working with into HMIS. They can see the notes in there, so it's kind of like a a patient record file, but for the housing system, and so that stays sort of that background stays in the record. So if we see, oh, this person was in our system in 2003 and they were housed, what happened? We, that's, we have that record. So we have this record system that allows us to track the, the success or lack thereof of a household as they move through the housing system. Um, in most programs, depending on the type, there are also required check-ins and verifications into that system about housing retention at six, 12, and in some programs, 18 months. So if there isn't, um, a, a sort of robust commu uh, case management relationship because the, the service is mostly rent assistance. And so it's basically, this is a household with low income, they needed some rent assistance to stay housed. There's not a 
case manager working with them on a regular basis, that program still has to check in with that household at six months, 12 months, and some, in some programs 18, and enter into HMIS their housing retention. And so we track returns to homelessness that way. So we, we pull reports on this HMIS system. Everyone who's been placed in a, a housing program find folks that, are re, that have come back into our system. They've, they've called coordinated entry again. They've, 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 they've appeared at a shelter or in, and they've been uh, connected through outreach. And so we're able to track who is not succeeding in our housing programs, why, what's the, uh, we look at racial disparities there. Um, break it down by program type. Um, we know that our permanent supportive housing programs have 99% and better housing retention rates at a year, which is excellent, but short-term rental programs have a much higher rate of, of failure, so to speak. A, it's a shallower subsidy. It's meant to, to solve a short-term crisis, and for some households, that short-term crisis compounds, and it becomes more complex. Um, so that's, that's one. Um, we also have... Um, through the Built for Zero initiative, uh, a, pro a process and a program to develop a by name list of every person in our community experiencing unsheltered homelessness. We already do that right now and we have successfully for several years for veterans experiencing homelessness. And the veteran, the homeless veteran coordination team has piloted what we are now going to apply across the county for all people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, which is every provider who touches that population and, and has some role in providing those services is at the table. We are working the list actively. It is literally a list of people by their name. They're ranked by vulnerability and acuity, and everyone who's, who's involved in the service network is there to identify, I know Johnny, I saw him here, I can connect with him, who's working with X, why isn't so-and-so in our coordinated entry system, but we know that they're homeless, so we problem solve that. So we're, we're moving into a more active and kind of, you know, uh, persons involved process as opposed to just a passive data system, HMIS, where we can track the progress of people that we're serving. We're now going to be actively tracking them with hand, a set of eyes around a table, literally, looking at a list and making plans for each person. Okay. So I was getting back to the marker. Is it their name, Social Security? I mean, how do we know that this person is you know, the same person. Yeah, it's in HMIS, it's an HMIS ID number. Um, other, um, when, when it's available, the last four of socials are entered in HMIS, and then name and, and date of birth. And so that's the most typical um, verification of, of identity that's done for deduplication purposes is the first letter of first name, last three letters of last name, and date of birth in the HMIS system. Okay. So like the, um, the the reason I ask the question, because I'm trying to make, trying to be able to discern accurately as best as possible, of course, that you know if a provider, um, SHS provider, providing a service to a household, and another provider provides services that same household, you know, is being double counted or triple counted in let's say over a year's time. So I'm just kind of identifying what what we have in our system when we look at the metrics to make sure that we're not double counting, triple counting when we talk about households. Yeah, yeah, and that's that is something that we actively do. We have a data quality process and and staff that work on that specifically. On for every report like this, the, the, there's a whole process for deduplication. So that that does occur. What you're describing, someone has received a service, and so that they appear, and then they also maybe appear to have received the service. So oh, two households received the service when in fact it's the same household. And so that due due due. due, 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 due <laughs> The duplication process is meant to not double count that, house, that household. I'm, I, I'm not in the R script or whatever. I, I'm not the, the data wonk on my team, so I couldn't walk you through the process of how my team dedupes, but it is something that we're, we're attending to. Okay, so when we identify through the HMIS, that should reconcile with the total households. Yes, definitely. that's right. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Savas, you had some earlier questions about during the consent agenda about numbers. Do you want to pose that now or wait till later? Uh, what was that? <laughs> okay. Oh, I think you were but asking about ahead, the, mot the hotel motel. Oh, yeah. I guess it was um, are we, was it where were you expanding or are we, oh, yeah, the, capa the total capac market capacity, mm -hmm. willing hotel owner, how many rooms, beds, are they, what, what is the capacity that's the market is willing to say, yeah, I have a Hotel X, you know, I, I'll, I'll make 10 available here and 
so on. I mean, we have a number for Clackamas County. I don't off the top of my head, Commissioner Savas, of how many motel rooms are available. We, you know, we work with six or seven on a, on a regular basis, and our partners um, sometimes have their own relationships. This is, a lot of this is relationship-based work. You have a good relationship with the motel owner or the manager, and they, they know your agency, they know you're responsive, and so they're, they're willing to work with you at a discount. Um, we have uh, worked with one provider in the community in the last few months that came forward and said, we're struggling with market uh, access or market capacity. And it was really their, their, their relationships were limited and so we helped them form some relationships with other motels and um, as far as I know, that issue that they were experiencing has been resolved. Uh, I haven't heard back from the executive director that they continue to have that challenge. It was that when, when they would go to their usual motels for placement of a vulnerable household who was fleeing a domestic violence situation, there wasn't an, a vacancy. And so they, they came to us and said, you have all these relationships with motels. Are you contracting with all of them? Are there rooms available in other ones? And so we were able to do some, some make some warm handoffs and introductions and expand their, their reach. Um, so far, you know, in the heat emergencies, in, in, the, in the previous one, not this week's and not the last weekend's, but the one before, uh, the long one, we, um, we, we housed 14 individuals in motels through um, social services. And, and it was instant. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a call, 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 call. It's place someone here, place someone here. Um, I've also had that experience with my team working with very vulnerable folks experiencing homelessness that rise to our awareness as critically vulnerable and needing immediate attention or they may die while experiencing homelessness, um, that we're able to place them in an available motel room immediately. So at the moment, we seem to be able to, to work with our, our, um, that sector in our local economy and, and make it work. But we do have a need for um, consistent access, which is why the, the county has contracted with two hotels historically to provide that motel shelter program under COVID. The Housing and Community Development Division is taking over the, that relationship from social services. Um, and, and in the coming weeks or months, we'll be bringing back to you uh, two contracts to replace the motel contracts that social services had, had held. Yeah, so you indicated, um, you already spelled out, so we have the hotel system for those heat, heat cold weather emergencies, let's just say, yeah. current, you know, inclement weather. We have them for, uh, you know, I guess long, I guess I won't say long-term housing, but, but housing that's longer than probably a year, right? There's models like that, and there's also the short-term. So are those the three Basic yes. categories, and is it is it about a hundred bucks a night? Is that about the the, the market rate right now? Yeah, there's it, it varies, but there is it's about a hundred one fifteen, and is when in our flex fund policies for our providers, we ask people to not you know uh, anything over one thirty. You need to get permission from us. And we need to see what's going on here. Um, the long term is is something that we're kind of phasing out as a component of motel shelter. That was the reality of COVID. There were people that stayed in the motel shelter program in COVID for more than a year. Mm -hmm. And you know we didn't have long-term rent assistance through this program available until October of, of last year. And once that was available, we aggressively man moved to immediately move people out of motel rooms into permanent housing. And our goal across our shelter system is to have the goal of 45 days. So if you're in an emergency sheltering situation, an emergency transitional situation, the the goal that our system needs to achieve uh, coherence on is a household is in that for less than 45 days, and then their homelessness is resolved permanently. Um, so we're, we're, we're drawing back from using a motel placement as a long-term uh, solution. It's, it's meant to be a stabilizing, safety off the streets, transitional opportunity. Yeah, I, I brought this up, and this is economics, really, frankly, and actually ability to serve even, probably even faster. So if you look at some of the apartment complexes, like Easton Ridge, for example, you have separate, I don't know what how many units are in there, 20 units per, per building. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if we were to actually to rent one of those exclusively, instead of the hotel model, we would save a tremendous amount of money because those aren't $100 a night, right? Those are like $1,500 a month. Right, so it's half the price if you want to call it that. And so I just thought we ought to be utilizing and looking at apartments and buying a block of apartments, or not buying, but renting a block of apartments if we can't buy them, yes. to offset that to reduce the price and serve and serve the people. And serve more, you'd serve twice as many people. Absolutely. You're saving 50% of the money. And, and we, are, we are doing that, we are pursuing that strategy of, um, with the regional long-term assistance program of, of 
uh, master leasing and block renting. We have um, PGAs working with us on a campaign to really uh, recruit property owners to, to partner with us. Um, we out offer some generous benefits to, to, to landlords, you know, consistent rent. We, we have a, a risk mitigation program that's being developed on the, on the, the tri-county, uh, on a tri-county platform to address uh, financial risks of damages to their property. We will help uh, cover that risk. Um, so we're hopeful that, like in Multnomah County, we'll be able to recruit some of, uh, some of these uh, private market apartments to be available for immediate move-in of households directly from unsheltered homelessness. The, the, we'll, we'll continue to need a component in our continuum of safety off the streets. And for some people, given their barriers or, their, or what's going on in their lives, their, um, an immediate move into an apartment and a lease situation is not an option. There are other stabilization and support activities that need to occur for that household. Some households are in dire critical emergency danger today on the sidewalk, and we need to, we need to take them out of harm's way. So that component of the system is more expensive per night per person, that emergency component, but you know, the emergency room is the most expensive component in our, our health system. You still have to have it when someone breaks their leg. So we're gonna continue to need shelter, but it's not meant to be the, the the component that ends the homelessness of the household. It's meant to be a component that stabilizes them, provides safety, and connects them to that transition. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, I just want to just mis mention that the uh, cost of, um, I'll use Salem Health as an example. Or, um, so if, you have a mental, if you're having a mental health crisis and you're willing to stay for, let's say, 10 days, um, that, that that cost is exorbitant. It's a couple $3,000 a day. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering in that kind of a model where we are managing, let's say, a apartment building and we have some people with mental health issues and we have experts there that are on site, you know, we can, we can save a lot, lot of money that way and help those people through a longer yeah. crisis because some people need a stabilization periods of longer for mental health um, uh, situations. So just say in lieu of not having that currently in our system at all in Clackamas County or this region, not enough space for, the, for that. I just want to just throw that out there. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Scholl. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, Mr. Brown, on your documents, uh, page 6, uh, is figure 1, FY2122, uh, funding and expenditures. Um, on the rental assistance and regional long-term rent assistance operations, uh, 574000 and below that, regional long-term rent administration 43,000 the 574,000 is that money's actually spent to pay for the lodging and rental assistance yes okay okay this that's direct dollars benefited by the individuals that's right and then the 43,000 in administration is that the cost here at the county that's right okay and then one more question uh, what is the difference between internal SHS program operations and operations and internal SHS program administration? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Schull. Um, it, it, administration costs for, for the SHS program include things like, um, uh, I forgot what it's called, but allocated to, to pay for TS, to uh, pay for allocated costs that, that are necessary for the administration of a program but aren't the specific delivery of that program. Um, the uh, senior management or the or a component of the, of the director of the division's salary that, admin that oversees the administrative components of program delivery, that's where internal administration lives. In, in the county. In the county. Internal operations are people on my team that are engaged in direct program delivery. So I have a, a um, staff that are program coordinators. They work directly with case managers on the, the conduct of case management, on you know, how you do this work. Uh, they, they provide support to them, they provide support to their clients, they help them navigate the system. So they're engaged in, they, they don't have maybe their own caseload, but in a sense they do. Their caseload is the case managers that they're working with and providing support to. So they're engaged in direct program delivery. And so that's operations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher? Yeah, I just wanted to talk briefly. Commissioner Savas brought up really good questions about data and duplication and deduplication. And I had the wonderful experience of participating in a seminar on Built for Zero, which was 
great. And the whole idea is not looking at, well, how many people have we provided services for, but really looking at how have we reduced homelessness? How are we collectively looking at the data and figuring this out because we don't want a never ending inflow of homelessness? <laughs> and it's pretty exciting the different and regionally how this is happening. And I know that the Tri-County Planning Group is going to be looking at this so that we can really hone in on it. And what I was, it was kind of new to me as the commissioner stepping into the seminar. And I was like, oh my gosh, we just really need to do this. And so I get texting with Clackamas County. It's like, oh yeah, we've been at this since 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So we are so well above it. And in fact, as I talk to um, different advocates across the region in Washington County, Multnomah County, they are coming to me, Vahid. I just want you to know this. And they are, they are saying, we want to know how Clackamas County is doing this because we want our jurisdictions to do this too. And I'm trying to like pull them back because like, you know, we're really busy here in Clackamas County implementing our plan. And I don't really, we play really nice at the regional table, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to promote a specific meeting with you and Vahid to do this. We are at the table regionally and we are working on this as a region, but we are so far ahead. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Yeah. Yeah. I have a quick question. So Vahid, you touched on briefly, but my question, what causes a return to hopelessness after being successfully housed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there's different ways to answer that question. Like what is the, for a, for a specific household, there's all kinds of things that can cause that. But if someone is, um, has uh, rental assistance through our one of our voucher programs, if they have income, a, a, a percentage of their income has to go towards their rent. Mm -hmm. So they do have a rent payment. If, if they aren't making that rent payment and they get notices and it's not resolved and it's not resolved and our caseworkers are not able to assist the household in making budgeting decisions or, you know, making a calendar, putting sticky notes, putting a reminder in your phone, whatever it is, it doesn't get resolved. And why is that happening? Well, that's a whole other set of, of, of causes and considerations. It could be happening because of a behavioral health concern. They might be unmedicated with a severe mental illness. They might have a severe mental illness and be medicating with street drugs and just not on top of daily uh, responsibilities. And so an eviction can happen. And we do everything we can to prevent that. And uh, you know, eviction for cause occurs uh, with households that we serve. Someone sets a fire in their unit. I mean, that's an eviction for cause. Um, and, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that they don't deserve housing. Everyone deserves housing in this, in this county. Um, and people that uh, require m higher levels of support, we identify them through that process. This, this, did, this intervention didn't work for you. And that's part of the data analysis and translating that to programs. Is Have you identified uh, employment and workplace opportunities? Do people lose their jobs because of this? Yeah. And do you counsel them on yep. you know, how to get a job, uh, how to advance in the workplace beyond what their current position might be? Yep. And that, that is a part of the, uh, of the bread and butter of that case management. Okay. Commissioners, any further um, questions or comments on this? Thank you. Thank you. Nancy? Thank you. Yes. What's next? Um, is, uh, we will satisfy the requirements on hearing this report? Yes. That okay. is correct. There's nothing to be, and it'll be turned in on September 15th. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Fisher? So, Chair Smith, I'm going to have to leave before my 12 o'clock and I am good for the rest of our business coming back at one if the rest of the commission would like to do that. I won't be able to do that. Uh, Nancy, what's left on the agenda? For so we have the supporting housing services annual work plan um, and then we also have the shelter acquisition guide. We have two, those two items. We um, could bump the shelter acquisition guide to September. We can put that till September? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what about the work plan? Is that the, timely? The work plan, I don't think, has to be done at this time either. It's, it's, and it's informational. It's informational. Okay. So, um, commissioners, uh, two have to leave. Um, so if we can tee those up uh, as soon as we come back. I'm not sure. You know, we put out a green sheet. We schedule things out for months. And I don't remember exactly what the green sheet says and if there's opportunities in our schedule for that, Nancy. Yeah, we will take a look. Tony and I will take a look today and see what we can move around. Thank 
Okay. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Talking Thank about you. this, Commissioner Scholl. Well, I was just going to say we can read the uh, Scholl's acquisition guide and the annual work plan. Maybe send you some questions between now and the end of the month. Uh, yes, please okay. do. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be a great. That'd be a great way to do it for all the commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Fisher, your lights on. Are you oh, done? I'm done? Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so with that in mind, Tony, you have anything? You're looking at me, Nancy. Do you have anything? No, ma'am, I do not. Hearing, seeing, and hearing no further business before this commission today, we are adjourned. <laughs>